citizens of the world, do not be alarmed. I have come before you now with the most hopeful of intentions. The transmission you are now viewing is being simultaneously broadcast to every city and nation on your planet. Because of my superior mental capabilities, I am able to telepathically send my thoughts through your television wires and satellites and automatically translate them so that all of the inhabitants of the earth can hear me now in your own languages and regional dialects. I am not part of any reality that you are currently able to accept, and yet I do share and occupy the same physical geography of your world. In truth, I am a purely mental entity who identifies himself only as the specimen. I have taken this physical form so that I will have more credibility as the purveyor of a very urgent message that I will soon share. I have come before you now to warn you of an unprecedented natural cataclysm that will set into motion a chain of events that will begin to destroy your world beginning in the year 2011. After years of scientific experimentation and environmental pollution, the Earth's axis will shift and its rotation will become more parabolic and prone to atmospheric disturbances. Eventually, a series of electrical storms and lightning will bombard every corner of the Earth, both land and sea, for a period of approximately two years. Your weather prognosticators and meteorologists will attempt to assure you that this anomaly will not last long and that there is nothing to fear. But as the days turn into weeks, and weeks into months, panic will set in among even the most erudite and sophisticated of your population. Scholars and philosophers will study and debate the existential issues that frequently arise during such times of unrest. Poets, musicians, and artisans of all disciplines will attempt to create lasting tributes that aspire to capture and reflect their most significant and insightful thoughts, but all their Pygmalions will ultimately end in futility. Sociologists and psychologists will put aside their professional differences and attempt to comfort and reassure the general public with their well-intentioned and well-selected words, but they will only wind up further alienating the already fragile dispositions of most of the general populace. False prophets will rise up, making bold predictions of the return of Jupiter Fulger, and staking inaccurate claims on the impending Holocaust, serving only to fuel the religious zealots of all denominations who will then draw their own erroneous conclusions. And finally, your most gifted scientists will work around the clock observing and analyzing the causes of the storm, but they will only manage to offer up the most feeble of theories to explain it. All of your man-made attempts to end the cataclysm, honorable though they may be, will end in failure. Of all the consequences of the storm, both mental and physical, none will be as significant and fatal as the effect it will have on the earth's sodium chloride, or salt, for those of you lacking even the most rudimentary working knowledge of chemistry. Through the process of electrolysis, the Earth's five oceans and all other great bodies of salt water, including the Dead and Caspian Seas, will have the sodium chloride contained within their boundaries converted into chlorine, hydrogen, and sodium hydroxide, or lye as it is most commonly known. All marine life will die. The plankton, nectin, and benthos of the sea will perish. Nations that relied heavily on the oceans and seas for their food and livelihood will be impacted greatly. All fish in the sea have died. I'm ruined. In the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans, the hydrogen and chlorine that had been released through electrolysis will recombine to form hydrochloric acid, turning those waters into veritable witches' cauldrons. Island nations of the Pacific and the Caribbean will be devastated immediately. Clouds of poisonous chlorine gas will hang over these islands, killing tens of thousands before eventually moving out further to sea. Survivors will watch in horror and tremble as their islands and eventually they themselves are literally eaten alive by the acid bath. 
a very painful and most unfortunate fate. Dry land too will not be spared from the wrath and fury of this storm. The constant bombardment of lightning and electricity on land will produce mostly local effects. The sodium chloride bond will be broken up, thus freeing the highly reactive sodium alkali metal to unite with other elements causing violent explosions, which will take their toll on the human population and render large portions of once fertile soil into barren wasteland. And, as it was at sea, the chloride will be freed from its sodium shackles and will return to its solitary gaseous state, creating ominous green toxic clouds that will hover over great cities and villages, sentencing millions to their horrific deaths. For when inhaled, chlorine gas turns into hydrochloric acid as it comes into contact with moisture from within the body. Tragic images like these will regrettably be all too common a sight. Ninety percent of the world's people will die within the two-year duration of the storm. Only a handful of land animals will remain, and all but the most resourceful of insects will be entrusted to antiquity. As the tempest finally subsides, survivors will instinctively begin to migrate to areas near fresh water, expecting to find abundant water supplies and seafood. But they will find neither. For the storm will take toll on these places as well. Significant evaporation of water and the electrocution of much of the aquatic life will greatly compromise the ability of these waters to sustain any form of life. With no other choice but to stay, new settlements will spring up where there had been none before. In North America, the heaviest population concentrations will be near the Great Lakes, Erie, Ontario, Michigan, Superior, and the Great Lake Huron. In South America, people will descend upon Lakes Titicaca and Maracaibo. On the African continent, survivors will settle on the banks of Lake Chad and Tanganyika. In Europe, orphans of the catastrophe will converge on Lake Geneva and Switzerland. In Asia, only the most vigorous and stout will make it to the Great Lake Bacall in Siberia. With limited fresh water supplies available, all life surviving in Australia will be dead within a few months after the storm abates. In Antarctica, the scientific research teams that had been stranded during the original cataclysm had no chance of survival and were now long forgotten. But proximity to the receding fresh water supplies will not be enough to save the human race. With over 98% of the Earth's salt supply destroyed during the storm, survivors will begin to develop a disease called hyponatremia, a condition brought on by a lack of sodium in the bloodstream. Human brains will be particularly sensitive to changes in the blood sodium concentration. Lethargy and confusion will set in. As the hyponatremia becomes more severe, your muscles will twitch and you will have seizures. In the most severe cases, stupor coma and death will occur. Human beings will turn on each other in their quest for salt to appease that insatiable hunger that mankind has possessed since he first crawled out of the oceans. The strong will enslave the weak and force them to produce salty perspiration, urine, and tears which will then be harvested for immediate consumption or used as a bartering tool on the salt black market for fresh water scarce plant vegetation or even more rare seafood and meat. Women will prostitute themselves to the alpha males and demand salt or highly concentrated saline solutions as payment for their services. Salt junkies will stop at nothing for their fixes. In the absence of salt they will turn to other halogen concoctions made of fluorine, bromine, iodine and astatine and then meet up with violent explosive deaths. The importance and value of salt will bring about a saline renaissance and a subsequent return of salt to the prominence and significance that it once had in the early days of your various civilizations and cultures. For those of you deficient in your knowledge of the history of sodium chloride, let me now enlighten you. In 2700 BC, the Peng Chao Kan Mu, the earliest known treatise on pharmacology, was published in China. A significant part of it describes more than 40 kinds of salt and includes descriptions of two salt extraction methods that are remarkably similar to present-day standards. 
In ancient Greece, the trading of salt for slaves was commonplace and gave rise to the expression, he's not worth his salt. In early Rome, salt was once so scarce and precious that Caesars would partially pay their soldiers with special salt rations called salarium argentum, which translates today as salary. What's more, the word soldier comes from the two words sol and dare, which means to give salt. Roman soldiers built the Via Salaria, or the Salt Road, which was used to transport goods from the salt works at Asti to Rome. Higher-ranking officials and Roman civilizations were seated within closer proximity to salt than others during feasts. But who were the great Roman salt makers? Viventius, Valuvius, and Canetus. Some primitive tribes actually produced salt coins, symbolic of its high value as an essentiality of life. Until relatively recently, salt bars were the standard currency of Ethiopia, and cakes of salt stamped to show their value could be used as money in countries as far apart as Tibet and modern-day Indonesia. Since time immemorial, salt has been thought of as a powerful magical substance in many civilizations. Spilling salt was considered to be a dangerous omen or harbinger of bad fortune. Yet even today, many of you throw salt over your left shoulders after spilling some in an attempt to cancel out the bad luck. It was once also thought to be unlucky to help anyone to salt. Hence the old expression, help me to salt, help me to sorrow. Superstitious sailors would not even mention the word salt while at sea and would never throw it overboard. In ancient Japanese theater, salt was sprinkled onto the stage before each performance to prevent evil spirits from casting spells on the actors and ruining the play. On a more positive note, it is customary in some countries to greet newlyweds with gifts of salt and bread instead of throwing confetti or rice. In Arab countries, salt was used to seal bargains and was also a sign of friendship. If you ate another man's salt, you couldn't harm him in any way while in his home, and he would not harm you. The Arabs say, there is salt between us, which means we have eaten together and we are friends. Salt at one time had religious significance and was a symbol of purity. Among Hebrews, it was a custom to rub newborn babies with salt to ensure their good health. The book of Job, written 300 years before the birth of Christ, asks, Can that which is tasteless be eaten without salt? The Bible mentions salt more than 30 times and refers to good men as salt of the earth. The Druids used salt in their rituals at Stonehenge. It is believed that this was a symbol of the life-giving fruits of the earth. But not all history of salt is ancient and antiquated. Salt has had a historical significance in relatively recent times as well. In 1777, during the American Revolution, the British Lord Howe was jubilant when he succeeded in capturing General Washington's salt supply. Salt taxes long supported British monarchs and thousands of Britishers were arrested for smuggling salt. In December of 1864, during the American Civil War, Union forces led by Major General George Stoneman made a forced march and bought a bitter 36-hour battle to capture Saltville, Virginia, the site of an important salt processing plant thought essential to sustaining the South's beleaguered armies. French kings developed a salt monopoly by selling exclusive production rights to a favored few, who then exploited that right to the point where the scarcity of salt was a major contributing cause of the French Revolution. Thousands of Napoleon's troops died during his retreat from Moscow, not because of the cold, but because their wounds wouldn't heal as a result of a lack of salt in their diets. But enough of your past. Let us now resume with your grim future. Eventually, even the hardiest and strongest of the world's survivors will succumb to the effects of hyponatremia. 
As the last of the fresh water supplies dries up and as salt becomes increasingly more scarce, the end of all life on Earth will appear imminent. By the year 2015, three continents will be completely void of life. Antarctica, Australia, and Africa. Only those who are able to adapt themselves to taking in little to no water and who can develop an acute saline sensory perception that can detect salt traces and deposits from great distances will have any chance of survival. Unbeknownst to most people, there will still be two areas on the earth with abundant salt supplies that could sustain life. Two areas that had been largely unaffected by the original cataclysm, but that had been either too remote or too undervalued as to be considered havens or sanctuaries at any earlier time. Survivors on the European and Asian continents, those with the most acute saline perception, will be drawn to Waliska, Poland, about eight miles from Krakow. To their amazement, they will find there an underground salt mine that had dated back to the 16th century, 270 meters below ground and covering some 6,000 square miles. It was the perfect salt sanctuary, in essence a salt city that was waiting for inhabitants. In its prime, Waliska was a flourishing and productive salt works. For over 400 years, miners had excavated the subcarpathian Miocene salt veins. Using simple contraptions like these horse gear whims or windlasses, they had created a subterranean salt world. Great artists like Handias, Nilsson, and Matiko had adorned this increasingly sacral place with their paintings, engravings, and ethnographic pieces. No artifact, however, had more significance than the Brotherhood of the Salt Digger's Horn, which dates back to 1534. Commissioned by the great salt master himself, Surin Boner, it was a gift to the salt makers and salt miners, symbolizing the special bond between them all. Architectural buildings were erected near the mines. The salt master's castle, the house amidst the salt mine, and the saline house were all characteristic of the period of Casimir the Great. Below ground, the miners had carved statues and altars out of the pure salt crystals, presumably to adore the earliest and most primitive of the salt gods. Of the roughly 3,000 survivors who will make it to Aliska, all will eventually become addicted to the salt that was now in abundant supply. Having adapted themselves to needing no water, save the minute traces that could be obtained from the salt crystals, the Halophiles, as they now called themselves, will begin to evolve into a paganistic salt society, worshipping at the statues and altars that the miners had built hundreds of years earlier, their idolatry will culminate in savage saline orgies complete with hedonistic rituals and strange theatrical performances. But the high concentration of salt in their newly adapted physiologies will create one undesirable effect in particular. Reproductive eggs and sperm will become crystallized, and when united during the sexual intercourse at the orgies, the byproduct will be a crystallized salt zygote, which will continue to grow and expand within the females. Unable to expel their monstrous progeny, the women will slowly and quite literally be turned into salt monuments. With no possibility of procreating the human species, the halophiles will essentially be condemned to death. Within 11 years of their arrival, the last of the pagan males will be gone and return to the earth.
Meanwhile, on the North and South American continents, survivors who can develop keen saline detection instincts will be drawn to Dolphin Island, a small salt insularity located in the northwest corner of Utah's Great Salt Lake. Unlike Waliska, Poland, Dolphin Island had little in the way of human activity and no significant history. Some 60 acres in size, it was the northernmost of the Great Salt Lake's islands, with the exception of a few scientists and researchers who went there to note its plant vegetation and animal life, there was no reason for anyone to have even known of this place, let alone give it importance at any time in the Earth's history. Dolphin Island had once supported a variety of desert shrub vegetation. In higher elevations, it was covered with shad scale, sagebrush, and cheat grass. In lower elevations, it had grown rabbit brush, greasewood, and rice grass. All along the southern shoreline was plentiful salt grass. Subspecies of the oared and chisel-toothed kangaroo rats had once inhabited the island. For reasons that are still not fully understood, the initial lightning and electrical storm cataclysm will spare Dolphin Island of her salt supply and only render the salt waters surrounding it into a very mild lye solution, making the two-mile swim to the island from the mainland not only very manageable but invigorating as well. By the time the 30 survivors arrive on Dolphin Island, only small patches of salt grass will remain. No other plant or animal life will exist, but even the limited amount of salt on the island itself will be more than enough to sustain these new inhabitants. All of the survivors will be male. There will be no possibility of sexual reproduction. And with no existing idols, statues, or altars, the tendency towards paganism will not be encouraged. Unlike the Halophiles of Waliska, who had engaged in raucous orgies, the Dolphin Island contingent will spend much of their time in reflective, meditative states as an attempt to conserve energy, thus decreasing their daily salt intake needs. But like the Halophiles, the men of Dolphin Island will too hunger for some kind of salt deity to give their lives meaning. Receptive and with heightened awareness during their meditations, some of the men will begin to receive visions of a salt god who will identify himself as Nackel. He will claim to be the perfect union of sodium and chloride preserved within a mental state. He will explain that he too had once been shackled by the chains of a human body, but he had come to Dolphin Island 13 years before the cataclysm and had slowly made the transition to his present state. He had been waiting years for these men to adore him and then join him as the neo-life forms that would be the new custodians of the earth, fulfilling the promises of life that human beings never could. After this brief encounter with their new god, the men will be summarily blown away. Several will become highly emotional and literally weep salt tears of joy. Others will sit in mute disbelief, still unable to fully process and comprehend the unexpected good news. But all 30 men will be more than willing to adore their new God and would do whatever it takes to join him in a perfect union of sodium and chloride. Instinctively, the men will begin to baptize themselves in salt to make themselves worthy of the great salt god Nacal. Throughout history, salt had been used as a highly effective preservative, and while the men of Dolphin Island will not be aware of this as they continue their preparatory rituals, the preserving properties of the salt will have already begun to take effect. After months of constant baptism, enough salt will be absorbed through their scalps and softened craniums directly into their brains so that it will begin to crystallize large portions of the cerebral cortex and cerebellum. Eventually, the men's bodies will begin to die off and wither away, but their brains, which contain the very essence of their souls and minds and memories, will be preserved. The new life that Nackel had promised them will become a reality. The perfect union of sodium and chloride retaining mental energy will be achieved by a true visionary, 
and then duplicated by his devoted disciples. Citizens of the world, do not be alarmed. I have come before you now with the most hopeful of intentions. I have spoken to you all, but will reach only one. Please find us. Let's gather around here. Um, as part of our science lab today, we are going to grow authentic Great Salt Lake brine shrimp. And these brine shrimp are alive, or they are in here, they are dormant in this condition right now. It looks like it's just a bag of sand, but they are actually in a dormant state in the soil. What we need to do is we need to actually place this in some salt water, and these brine shrimp actually will grow. They live in salt water with very high salt uh, content and then they will live for about three weeks and they'll die. So anyone who ever has heard of sea monkeys, essentially that's what, what it was. Let's go ahead and get started and all we're going to need to do is to get some salt and some water. 